Glory to today's glorious sponsor, HelloFresh. Do you love slaving over a hot stove when it's 107 degrees outside, which is something in Celsius that I guess I'd understand. I think that's the late 30s, right? Pretty hot. Well, neither do I. That's why HelloFresh has made special limited time recipes for you to try out this summer. Ooh, that sounds fantastic. We're talking about specially curated summer delights that are going to make your mouth water. It's all there. And starting this month, that's August, by the way. It is indeed beginning of August. Not sure when this ad's going out, but August. I would guess. HelloFresh is launching its Taste of Summer series. It's going to get you out of that steamy kitchen and outside for some grilling and farm fresh sides. Succulent barbecue bundles, grillable protein, surf and turf, classic summertime delights. Grillable proteins is essentially summer to me. Grillable proteins is where it's at, and that's a great term for it. This is just the latest development from HelloFresh, the meal kit service that's all about keeping your mealtime fresh and adventurous. Yes, with HelloFresh you get a specially designed five-star meal kit that's going to break you out of that recipe rut. We've talked about that before. You know you always end up making the same stuff over and over again? Not with HelloFresh. They work with local farmers to send you delicious locally sourced meals. They'll be skipped the meal prep and put dinner on the table in how long? 30 minutes or less! That is very fast. Uh, I've mentioned this before, I didn't actually get to try HelloFresh because I live in a part of Europe, Prague, Czech Republic, where they don't serve, so I sent it over to Davin, who I do another channel today I found out with, and he loved it. So that's fantastic. Go to HelloFresh.com, use the code CRIMINALIST14 to get 14 free meals, including free shipping. 14 free meals, code CRIMINALIST14 at HelloFresh.com, and let's get into today's video. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one is Jerry Brudos, the shoe fetish slayer. If you're new here, my name is Simon. I'm the host of this show, obviously. What happens is the writer for this channel, Callum. He always prepares me a fine script, which I know often, sometimes I know a little about because I listen to like, or have read or have watched another show about what we're covering, but rarely, and this one I've never heard of, uh, Jerry Brudos. I don't know if you have, but we're going to jump into it. Callum writes the script. I cold read it, and then Jen, afterwards, our wonderful video and audio editor, adds the soundscape, adds some images if you're watching the video version. And if you are watching the video version, please do leave a thumbs up. If you're listening to this as a podcast, leave a review. Five stars preferred. Why not? Anyway, should we just jump into it? Uh, today, I will say <laughs> the shoe fetish slayer is like <laughs> immediately in our incredibly like PC culture. Simon, Simon, don't kink shame. Some people are into shoe fetish slaying. It's like, yeah, they just like it. It's a preference. It's like, it, it might be a preference, but when there's murder, uh, that that's no longer okay. It's just not. Let's go. On April the 21st, 1969, Portland State University employee Sharon Wood walked out of the history department toward the parking lot across campus where she left her car. Parking lot across campus? I don't know, immediately, I'm like, the campus where I went to university was really big. I'd park in the parking lot outside the building, not across campus. Could be like, yeah, yeah, going home. 20 minute walk to my car. She walked this same route dozens of times each week, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary at first. But what she didn't know was that as she made her way through the crowds of students moving between classes, someone was watching her every move. As she approached the parking complex, a voice in her head told her not to take the secluded side stairwell. Something wasn't right, though she couldn't quite put her finger on it. Sharon ducked around the corner through the main entrance and down towards the basement level. But as she reached the bottom of the ramp, heavy footsteps approached her from behind. A man grabbed her by the shoulder and spun her around with a gun to her chest. Scream and you're dead, he said. I have to say, I'm one of these people where it's like, you know when you get a bad feeling about something? And I, I but the problem is I get it in like ridiculous places. Like I'm sitting on a plane on the tarmac and it's about to take off and you're like, oh my God, what if the plane crashes? What if this is the time where the plane crashes? And I got this fee, you got this feeling and it's like, this is gonna be the time. And statistically, obviously, you know, it's not. And uh, I recently had surgery. I had anxiety about like, oh my God, this is the time. This is definitely that time where you have the anesthesia and you're awake while they're cutting you open or you don't wake up. This is the time. So I'm always like actively tamping down that feeling because most of the time it's bull and so I'm exactly the person who'll be like, don't take that secluded stairwell. And then I'll get a hold of myself and I'll take the secluded stairwell. Because, you know, most of the time you're not going to get murdered. 
except that one time. But you can't be on a plane that's about to take off and be like, excuse me, <laughs> uh, I'd like to get off the plane because that's some final destination right there. But Sharon, quite understandably, did scream. She would have surely alerted the entire campus had the man not thrown her to the ground and pressed her hand against her mouth. Sharon fought back. She clamped down her jaws and sank her teeth into the knuckle of his thumb with a crunch, tasting the sharp, metallic tang of blood. Now it was the attacker's turn to scream. With his free hand, he grabbed Sharon's hair and smashed her head into the ground, desperate for her to relent. It took a flurry of hard knocks of head against concrete before she slipped unconscious and let him go. The kidnapper had won the battle but lost the war. A car was approaching from inside the garage. He left Shannon where she lay, picked up his pistol, and took off. That's awesome. Sharon, I hope you're okay, but I get the feeling you're gonna be like, I just hope you're okay. But I get the feeling because we're at the page one of a really big script that like something bad's still gonna happen to you. Or maybe you're the person who, maybe he now gets caught because of this because they have his blood or something. That's what I hope for you, Sharon. Sharon awoke to some concerned students surrounding her with an ambulance crew following soon after. She was too shocked to explain at first, but after collecting herself, she managed to give the police a description of the man. Heavy set, quite tall, early to late thirties, cropped light hair, and if she remembered correctly, he was wearing some women's clothing. That's what I would lead with. It'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's dressed as a woman. He's tall. <laughs> like, I wouldn't know. So uh, yeah, here's a mundane description. And he was uh, a crossdresser. Lead with the crossdressing, maybe. The cops didn't know it at the time, but this was the first recorded sighting of a soon-to-be infamous serial killer that had been stalking Oregon for the past year, murdering and terrorizing women. The man who attacked Sharon that day was none other than the Shoe Fetish Slayer, a classic case study for any student of criminal psychology. Not content to just raid through charity shop dumpsters like a normal person, this sadistic murderer went to extreme lengths to satisfy his obsession with female footwear. Why do you have to scavenge for it through charity shops? Just spend money on it like a normal person, unless he wants it to be worn already. Which is a whole other kind of weird, isn't it? His story, I don't kink shame Simon, some people, it's, uh, okay, okay, just calm down. His story, a definitive one from the golden age of American serial killers, <laughs> golden age, oh my god, went on to birth so many pop culture tropes that the original seems a bit cliche in, in retrospect. This is the story of the murderous fetishist's gruesome spree, tormented beginnings, and ultimate capture at the hands of the Oregon police and the FBI. Oh, spoiler alert, so he gets captured. Well, good. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I guess. Why do I have to say I guess? It's obviously good he got captured. He was a serial killer. <laughs> well, good, I guess. <laughs> Dumbest thing I've said so far in an episode, probably. Trouble in Oregon. It all began when a teenage girl named Linda Slauson went missing without a trace from a Portland suburb on January the 26th, 1968. That evening, the 19-year-old was out working her part-time job selling encyclopedias door-to-door. Parents alerted the police when Linda failed to return home and a search of her route was conducted. People in the neighborhood confirmed that she knocked on their door that night, but somewhere along the way, she simply vanished. No trace, no witnesses, no body. Exactly 10 months later, 23-year-old Jan Whitney of McMinnville was driving home from a Thanksgiving celebration when a car broke down. Her vehicle was later found at a rest stop just north of Albany, but Jan wasn't there with it. Once again, nobody had any idea what happened to her until an anonymous letter arrived later that same week. The writer claimed to have watched from the rest stop restaurant when the missing women left in a car with a strange man. And <laughs> I'm sure Jen cut it out. But it took me about seven tries to get that sentence out. For some reason, it's very difficult to read. It's like, rest stop restaurant. Blah, blah, blah. Tongue twister. A public appeal was lodged for the writer to come forward, but they never revealed themselves. Handwriting experts advised that the writer had actually tried to obscure the handwriting on the letter, so some believe that it may have been penned by the person who kidnapped Jan as a way to brag about their crime. Guys, 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 we talked about it. Number one. Don't write down your crimes. Number two, don't brag about your crimes. These are the, the most important rules of the everyday criminal. That was the last lead on the disappearance. A few months later, on March the 27th, 1969, Oregon State University student Karen Sprinkler was supposed to meet her mother for lunch at the Meyer and Frank department store in downtown Salem. Not the witch trials ones, that's Salem, Massachusetts. Yeah, places in America, there's so many places in America with the same name, which I always found slightly strange, but uh, it is what it is. A place with strange. I went to a place called Weed. <laughs> it's a funny place, and all of the gift, all of the stores in the town sell T-shirts like saying "I love weed." It's like very funny. 
Witnesses reported seeing her arriving at the rooftop parking lot, but for some reason she never made it inside the building. Her mother was left waiting and called the police when she discovered her daughter never made it back home from her university dorms either. After that, it was the turn of Sharon Wood, who almost came out of the encounter with one extra finger for her trouble. She wasn't the only one to follow the plans of the shoe fetish killer. The very next day, he went after his youngest target, 15-year-old Gloria Jean Smith. She was walking along the side of the train tracks near Parish Middle School, Salem, on April the 22nd when a green car pulled alongside her. A strange man hopped out and tried to drag the teenager inside, pointing what appeared to be a cheap plastic gun at her head. But the teenager fought back screaming and broke away. When a local woman saw what was happening from her garden, she called out, and the kidnapper jumped back behind the wheel and fled. Two failed abductions in as many days, but third time was the charm. Dude, if you failed to do two abductions in two days, maybe take a break, work on your technique. Why am I giving tips to criminals again? Although he does succeed on day three, so what is going on the day after 22 year old linda saley arrived at portland's lloyd shopping center to pick out a birthday present for her boyfriend she finished up 5 30 p.m and was last seen walking out of a jewelry store somewhere between the shop and her car she was intercepted by the kidnapper and disappeared without a trace it was only after linda was reported missing that the police started to suspect that the ser- that a serial killer might be at large they didn't have to wait long for their fears to be confirmed a gruesome catch on May the 10th, fisherman Sam Wallace went out early in the morning to find a nice spot along the Long Tom River. You know he's going to find a body. <laughs> fisherman often finding the bodies. Walking down the banks, he caught a flash of white out of the corner of his eye. Something was floating just beneath the surface of the water. Wallace climbed up onto a tree branch to get a better look and positioned himself above the pale shadow in the dark, murky water. This probably isn't your first true crime rodeo, so you won't be too surprised to learn what it was. It was a really large fish. No, it was a body. It was a body. I mean, fishing must surely rank in the top three pastimes in which you're most likely to find corpses one spot above hiking and one below actual grave robbing yes Callum and I same page and sure enough as Sam Wallace's eyes focused on that ghostly figure beneath him he saw spindly human hair waving with the current drifting over the still gray human face staring back at him I have to say like it's interesting making all these true crime videos and all these people and, and podcasts and all these people like discovering bodies and stuff I've never seen a dead body Never in my whole life, and I have really no desire to. I saw a guy get into a terrible motorcycle accident once, but he definitely wasn't dead. Maybe he died. It was horrific. I don't really want to talk about it, so let's move on. It was Linda Saley's body, floating in the river a little over two weeks after her disappearance. When the police divers arrived at the scene to remove the body, they discovered it was tied to a heavy car transmission with copper wire and nylon cord. That's why she never floated up to the surface completely. After carefully removing the remains, the police spent the next two days dredging the riverbed, crawling along through the mud in search of any further victims. On the second day, one of them came across a rusted-out car engine with a nylon cord wrapped around it. Tied to the other side was a female body suspended in the middle of the water. This was Karen Sprinkler, the third woman to disappear six weeks before. Her heavily decomposed remains were a gruesome sight, enough that any responsible podcast host would fire out a content warning right about now. So consider yourself warned, and I'm also warned. I guess we're going to get into the details of this, which is wonderful. Thanks, Callum. The killer is cut out. Oh, God. <laughs> Whenever I'm reading these, it like, as a, you know, doing the cold read or whatever of the script, I'm always like a few words ahead. You know, so I'm reading ahead and then it comes out of my mouth a few seconds after because that way you screw up less. Also, I present a lot of YouTube videos, so I've really honed this skill down. And immediately, I've already read what it is and it is horrible. So, take a deep breath. The killer had cut out the victim's breast and stuffed the cavities left behind with brown paper towels held in a bra. Curiously, it wasn't the victim's own. Now the police officially had a serial killer case on their hands and a clear victim profile too. Young, attractive, well-dressed women, most of whom either studied or worked at universities in Oregon. So they started staking out places frequented by young women and canvassing female students at the universities to see if any of them could help identify the killer. Wow, guys, this is you don't have a lot to go on. That is really really a lot of manpower and a lot of questioning based on you know he kills women let's go hang out where women are well that's only 50 percent of the population <laughs> and it just so happened that one of them had a pretty interesting story to tell okay <laughs> i was wrong great job police rarely say it credit to you bravo the sting 
On the 14th of May 1969, a student at the university contacted the police to report that she had been receiving strange phone calls from a man claiming to be a lonely Vietnam veteran, asking her out on a date. In fact, dozens of women at the university had been asked out on dates uh, by this guy who had distinct serial killer vibes. Cold calling for a date is a pretty bold move, even for the more charismatic Casanova, but somehow it actually paid off on more than one occasion. It's a numbers game, isn't it? You just phone enough women and ask for a date. One of them's going to say yes. <laughs> it's a very bizarre way to go about things. You're not selling windows. <laughs> The woman who tipped off the police had actually gone out with the man in question, a heavyset man with light hair and freckles. He convinced her to join him by saying that he wanted to discuss psychiatric treatments he learned about while, as a, while a patient at the Walter Reed Medical Center, something that aligned with the university studies. They went out for lunch and coffee, and things started amicably enough, but towards the end of the date, things got creepy real fast, which is why, you know, pro tip, obviously done here. Just meet the person for lunch, in the daytime, in a busy coffee shop, maybe next to a police station. <laughs> the day took a sour turn when the man reached over the table and placed a hand on her shoulder, massaging it gently. For some reason, he asked her to feign sadness so that he could pretend that he was comforting her. <laughs> Dude, that is so psycho. <laughs> hey, I need you to pretend to be sad, so I can rub your shoulder and comfort you. Dude, did, what, what? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> you psycho, what is up with that? Oh, get out of there! If that doesn't scream stranger danger, nothing does. I've got a kid and another kid on the way. Thank you for everybody who saw the last episode who was posting on Twitter. I'd announced it actually on another channel that I did, but it's weird because I don't really have like I'm not a big Twitter user, but uh so I don't really have like a platform to like update people on my personal life, but I'm having another kid. And it's like my other kid's like a year and a half old. And it's like you gotta teach them about like stranger danger and stuff. It's like don't always be polite. There are psychos. If someone's being weird, tell them to off. It's okay. You can use the bad word in that situation. <laughs> you know, it'll really throw them off. You're like, you f off right now, you psycho pedophile. That's right. Get on it, kid. Even worse was when he referenced the bodies recently found in the river, asking why she would agree to meet a stranger at a time like this. How did she know that he wasn't going to take her down there and throw her in with them? He did not get a kiss goodnight. Wait, didn't they meet for lunch? How long was this date? <laughs> It's like it lasted all afternoon, despite the weird feign your sadness and let me pet your shoulder. <laughs> You're like, I am out of that. However, he did get a second date, which is not with the person he expected. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Detectives asked the woman to keep stringing the strange guy along to see if he contacted her again, which he did on May the 25th. This time, when he drove up to her university dorms to get her, it was the cops who picked him up instead. In the style of To Catch a Predator, the cops asked the sweaty palmed seater to please take a seat. And that led him through an empty office room in the dormitory. Those like To Catch a Predator, why don't you sit down? It's like, Mwah! <laughs> During this initial round of questioning, he was revealed to be a 30-year-old teetotal Portland electrician named Jerry Brudos. Jerry was compliant and truthful during that first interview, explaining that he was just trying to find love despite having a wife at home. Oh god, what are you up to? And his weird comments were just misfired jokes. Hey, will you feign sadness so I can pet your shoulder and give you a little massage and make you feel better? Just feign it, you don't have to really be sad. What? Ah, 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 it's just a joke. It's just a joke. It's not, it's not funny at all. It's so psycho. Stop. It's not funny. It's not funny. Oh, so he's allowed to walk free. But the next day, the police followed up with a home visit and found some interesting items in his garage. Actually, the basement garage space was suspicious in and of itself, locked up tight, so even his own wife and two kids couldn't go inside without buzzing an intercom. If you've got a psycho dungeon like that, uh, if it... it <laughs> If your husband is overly protective of his man cave, just maybe sneak down there sometimes, make sure there's no like circular sores and blood staining the walls and bodies in the freezer, all right? Just a message to all the wives out there. <laughs> just, just in case, you know? You know? And inside, the detectives caught sight of some rolls of nylon cable and copper wire with what appeared to be the same distinctive knots used to tether the women to the makeshift anchors in the river. That day, they also discovered that Brudos' mother was the owner of a green Volkswagen Carmen Gear. The I never heard of it. The exact same uh, model and color used in the attempted kidnapping of Gloria Smith. None of that was enough for an arrest, but it was good enough to get a search warrant for the vehicles. Two days later, the detectives returned with said warrant. Why does it take two days? I'll be like, yo, 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 yeah, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna come back with a warrant and search those vehicles. So whatever you do, 
don't destroy any evidence because destroying evidence is illegal and it's a crime <laughs> and the, the killer surely he's just like you know what it's less than a crime then serial killing so i'm gonna go ahead and scrub the blood out of the trunk allegedly Two days later, detectives returned with said warrant and rifled through the cars for evidence. Nothing conclusive came of it, but the whole show apparently spooked Buddha so much that he decided to take his chances on the run. He loaded up his wife and two kids into a car and fled up north, possibly heading for Canada. Had he left a little sooner, he might have gotten away for good, but the cops were keeping close tabs on him by this point. <laughs> of course they were. It's like, we're coming out with a search warrant for your car. Don't try and run away to Canada. Also, fairly sure that the US and Canada... Canada's not one of those non-extradition countries. You know, it's like, where did he run off to? Well, he ran off to Uruguay. And I don't know if there's an extradition treaty where you know, like where they get the criminals back between Uruguay and the United States. But I'm willing to bet there is between Canada and the United States because they're friends. <laughs> Authorities quickly realized he was missing by this point and put out an APB for the Brudos family car. They were pulled over later that evening, just a few hours north of Portland. Brudos was arrested and charged with attempted kidnapping after a positive ID from Gloria Smith linked him conclusively to that crime. His one shot at escape was blown and the dominoes kept tumbling from there. While he was being booked into Salem County Jail, the guards discovered a piece of unexpected circumstantial evidence that connected him to the sprinkler and wood cases too. As they were stripping him down to charge him into his jumpsuit he threw down his trousers to reveal a little surprise a pair of silky women's underwear oh god not a particularly good look for a new fish <laughs> new fish <laughs> I've watched too many prison movies. That wasn't the only kinky little secret that Jerry was hiding either. Now that the cops could run a comprehensive search on the garage, they unearthed a hoard of evidence that brought the full weight of his crimes piling down on the shoe fetish slayer like a high heel to the temple. Jerry the Stiletto Snatcher before we start rifling through a serial killer's dirty laundry, both figuratively and literally, let's take a closer look at the man himself and how he came to be the way he was. Let me guess, abusive parents, just, just, a, or abandoned by parents, just a stretch. Don't abuse your kids lesson. The origin story of Oregon's most infamous serial killer begins innocently enough. Before he was a ruthless murderer with a penchant for mutilation, Jerry Brudos was just an innocent young boy with a love of ladies' high heels. Born in South Dakota on January the 31st, 1939, Jerry was the second son, a fact his mother Eileen resented deeply as she had been praying for a girl. I don't understand that. I know people like want, like women want a girl, dads want a boy i think that's at least talking to my friends it tends to be the case and yeah i'd like a son and before i had a daughter my first child's a daughter my, my daughter i was like yeah that'd be nice i like I'd, I'd i'd like to have a son you know i don't know it's just i'd like that i don't know why i guess because i'm a man where you go fish i don't even fish but like fish together and obviously i could do that with my daughter and all that stuff but as soon as i had a daughter I was like, I just don't care anymore. This is the sweetest thing in the world. And I I don't mind if I have... I don't know how many kids I'll have. But if I, I, I don't mind if I had eight daughters. I'm definitely not going to have eight kids. <laughs> but it's like that... I, it just stopped mattering to me entirely. Because I was like, this is the sweetest thing in the world. And it's... Yeah. Like, <laughs> we're talking about something so sweet in the middle of something so horrific. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Let's just get back to it. She never let the poor got boy, little boy forget it. Whenever she wanted to punish her son, she would dress him up in girls' clothing and mock him. Ah, yes, what a surprise. Child abuse. Eileen was repulsed by any mention of sex and sexuality and used her young son's eccentricities as an excuse to ostracize him, turning him into the family freak. By his later toddler years, little Jerry was already well on the way to developing some hefty psychological issues, and it was then that he found an object to attach them to. While wandering around a junkyard at the age of five, he spotted a flash of red among the piles of scrap metal and car parts. It was a discarded pair of open-toed high heels. Not one to pass up a bargain, Jerry took the shoes for himself and strutted back home to show off his new look. But unfortunately, mum and dad weren't big fans of drag, although his mum dressed him up as a girl, right? So... Yeah, great, great, great mothering there. Great parenting, good job. When Mrs. Brudos heard the unmistakable clanking of high heels on the porch, she opened the door to find her youngest walking around in a pair of shoes about a dozen sizes too big for him. Innocent enough, just because a curious little kid puts on some women's shoes doesn't mean he's set to be a serial killer. But what came next probably birthed the dark side of Jerry's obsessions. His puritanical mother once again violently berated little Jerry and ordered him to sashay away 
to the dump to return his new favorite shoes. Instead, crafty little Jerry stashed his prized possessions and tried to bring them back to the house in secret. Foiled again, his mother confiscated and burned them, sending his first love up in smoke. And from there, the psychopath is born, it does seem. From that point on, the act of secretly collecting women's shoes was instric- inextricably linked with Jerry's deep hatred of his domineering mother and, by extension, women in general. Eileen imbued her little boy with a wealth of psychological complexes like this. So began an obsession that would manifest throughout his entire life, an obsession with women's shoes and clothes, collecting them, and later on in life, collecting the body parts that came with them. Jerry's first high heel heist happened. That was a retake. <laughs> when he was in first grade, he noticed that his teacher switched out of her comfy shoes into high heels at the start of the day. She also kept a spare pair of heels under her desk. Jared spent all day staring at them, planning how to get them for himself. One day, he racked up the courage to snatch the objects of his affection and slip them into his school bag. In the end, a classmate ratted him out, sending Jerry running out of the room in shame. That classmate said, "Dickhead." <laughs> Why would you rat him out? Little Jerry also got a reputation for sneaking into neighbors' homes to steal women's underwear for his collection. He would befriend little brothers of teenage girls and use this as an excuse to get access to their bedrooms. Each time he was caught, he'd endure another round of beatings and shaming from his mother. Well, okay, I didn't know there were beatings, but I think that's the first mention of beatings. This player, shaming and all of that stuff will do plenty to turn a kid, you know, bad. But the beatings as well, <laughs> shocking. Child abuse is part of our serial killer's backstory. What a surprise. And he spent much of his youth in and out of various therapy programs. Already his burgeoning shoe fetish was a bit more extreme than just getting a bit hot under the collar in Foot Locker. By his teenage years, Jerry's obsession with feet and footwear was developing in some seriously worrying ways. Had he been born in a different era, he may have just grown up to developing to develop a crippling OnlyFans addiction. But in lieu uh, of that, his outlets were a bit more direct. After he got big enough to start taking what he wanted directly rather than sneaking around, Jerry Brudos was a menace to his neighborhood. He made a habit of stalking women who walked alone at night, strangling them unconscious, then running off with their shoes. I can only imagine the strange mix of terror and relief as you regain consciousness and the only thing you find missing is your high heels. Oh my god, it's got to be absolutely terrifying. <laughs> like, <laughs> but also like, oh thank god. Why didn't you just bring a gun and ask me to take off the shoes? I, I happily do it. I was talking to a guy the other day who was robbed. Like, he was in an alley. And some guy, oh no, he didn't have a knife. He just came up to him. I said, give me a wallet. And he was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god. Although this guy was bigger than me. I'd just be like, yeah, take my wallet. Please don't kill me. <laughs> it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. I'd just be like, yeah, you can have my shoes, you psycho. I'm such a coward. But an alive coward. The shadowy shoe bandit was finally caught out when his sick control fantasies took another turn. In his mid teens, the family moved to a new town in Oregon for a fresh start, which may or may not have something to do with their son's panty raids and strangling expeditions. Wait, he never got caught for like strangling people and taking their shoes? This wasn't even looked into? At 16, Jerry spent an entire weekend digging a deep pit on a remote hillside where he fantasized about imprisoning a woman woman, and having a beg for mercy. Yes, exactly like Silence of the Lambs. In fact, Brutus was one of the main inspirations for Buffalo Bill himself. Well, there you go. Thankfully, nobody ever found their way into the sadistic teenager's torture pit, but it was clear that he was becoming more ambitious with his perversions. Then, when Jerry was 17 years old, he concocted a plan to get a local girl under his control. He stole a pair of her underwear and told her that he knew who the culprit was and wanted to help her get them back. He, w he convinced the girl to come to his family's farmhouse, and when she stepped up to the door, he grabbed her, his face covered by a mask and a kitchen knife in his hand. He then forced her to strip down and pose and took dozens of photographs before letting her go. As the <laughs> Dude, how do you think this is going to end for you? <laughs> like, you're at... You yeah, I was wearing a mask. She didn't know it was me. You invited her there. It's your family's farmhouse. What do you think is going to happen? How on earth do you get away to kill more people with this situation going on? You better get some sort of punishment for this. As the terrified girl gathered up her things to leave, she ran into Jerry's older brother, who said that the intruder locked him in the barn during the attack. The girl reported the ordeal to the police, but no arrests were made. 
Police, what are you up to? Please get on it. So the next year, Jerry decided to try a similar plan. He kidnapped a 17-year-old girl in his car and drove her out to a deserted farmhouse where he proceeded to beat her severely. A couple walking past the property heard the girl's screams and went to investigate, finding the teenager looming over his victim. Jerry tried to claim that he was actually helping the girl and had already chased the real attacker off, but the couple weren't buying it. They called the police and Jerry confessed to everything. During a search of his room, they unearthed his cache of stolen underwear and non-consensual pictures, setting his perverted collection back to square one. That's how Brudos ended up at the psych ward at Oregon State Hospital, good, where he was officially diagnosed with borderline schizophrenia, sexual fetishism, and severe pathological mummy issues. My wording, not theirs. Sexual fetishism? Diagnosed? Isn't... I feel like having a sexual fetish is okay. Um, I, I personally don't think i have a sexual fetish but it's also like that's okay you can have that we mentioned in the beginning that's totally okay just not when it's you know murder <laughs> despite being committed oh it's night it's it's like 1950s though right despite being committed he was still able to go to high school during the daytime and graduated successfully in 1957 in the bottom third of his class his nine months on the mental ward gave jerry the tools he needed to suppress his violent perversions or at least the ability to hide them from the psychiatrist to convince them that he was cured but his public face was still a work in progress after being discharged from the hospital young jerry decided to trade out the high heels for a pair of combat boots that is quite the change and take a crack at military life luckily the standards for entry into the u.s army weren't exactly the strictest during the vietnam era so his assault conviction and psychological diagnoses weren't flagged up as a problem ah yes the guy who did a whole lot of weird stuff and kidnapped people he's the sort of person we want to send off to an extremely high stress environment brilliant well done u.s military but it wasn't long before maladjusted rookies eccentricity started causing some friction in the barracks according to radford university's timeline of his life jerry's main military ambition was to get stationed in korea and he began to have dreams that a korean girl would seduce him <laughs> okay mate i think you've misunderstood exactly what the military is going to be like there's going to be more guns and death and boredom and shooting and less being seduced by uh foreign women i think just just a guess there from me to you uh let's see how it pans out though maybe he was seduced by a beautiful korean woman had a fast fantastic time in korea and uh, the rest of his life went swimmingly well spoiler alert it didn't after being stationed at fort gordon georgia he was advised and i assume that's georgia united states rather than the country of georgia because you know i mean it's not an exotic locale is it georgia he was advised to talk about his complex domination fan fantasies with the army chaplain oh god <laughs> where should we send him how about a mental health professional no 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 send him to the chaplain the chaplain will be able to figure all of this out and absolutely not give him a guilt complex and tell him that he's going to hell for wearing high heels because that's real the chaplain quickly decided that mad stuff was well above his pay grade and kicked the can down the road to an on-base psychiatrist in this case the can got kicked to exactly the right place after that meeting jerry's record only states that he was discharged for bizarre obsessions which is the polite and professional way of saying that this bloke is absolutely mental humiliated and disgraced gi jerry returned home to face his sneering parents once again they allowed him to move back into their home on the condition that he slept in the farm shed solid parenting that you're 20 something at this point your old son or around there comes back and uh, they're like yeah yeah, yeah. you sleep in the shed now <laughs> you volunteered for vietnam and uh yeah welcome to the shit. to vent his frustration at that little indignity he went back to his old ways jerry i don't think necessarily that's just him venting i think that's because he's uh, a little bit crazy and has a lot of problems and uh he was gonna go back to his old ways anyway wasn't he he got discharged from the army for weird obsessions jerry strangled a random woman unconscious then curled up to sleep in his cold damp shack caressing her shoes like some sort of foot fetish fetishist golem his life had hit rock bottom but things started to bounce up from there jerry trained as an electrician and by the age of 22 had met a 17 year old girl named darcy metzler who would become his wife her parents were deeply against the match meaning they had some taste but their disapproval only drove darcy deeper into the arms of jerry ah parenting very complicated stuff i mean like uh, like right now as a father of a young daughter who's like 19 months but i i see into the future and i'm like how do i not have that sort of relationship with my daughter because <laughs> that's not what you want she was the first woman to treat him with any genuine affection to outside observers brudos became a perfectly normal family man after that in fact he was a little more boring than normal he didn't drink he didn't smoke and he barely 
ever swore. But behind closed doors, his deviant side was out in full force. In the early years of their marriage, Jerry demanded that Darcy serve him unconditionally as a housewife and wear nothing but a pair of high heels around the house. <laughs> Holy shit, that is weird and demeaning. Their little detail probably seemed a lot more shocking back then. I mean, even today, it's like if you're into that, and your wife or partner or whoever is into that, fantastic and good on you. But uh, ju just to guess here, I'm going to guess that she was probably less into it than he was. But by all accounts, she was deeply under his control brainwashed even. The couple moved around for a while before settling in Portland, Oregon. There, Jerry got a good job as a radio station tech. The couple had a daughter in 62 and a son in 67. Throughout that relatively blank spot in his biography, it seemed like the love of a good woman kept his dark side mostly under wraps, but psychologists have identified the birth of their son Jason as a turning point when the violent switch in his head flicked back on. While she was in labor, Darcy barred Jerry from entering the maternity ward for reasons unknown. It's thought that the resulting sense of betrayal and disempowerment triggered a regression to his old shoe-stealing ways. Not long after his little boy was born, Jerry was walking around Portland when he spotted a woman walking down the street wearing high heels, just the type he liked. Infatuated with her looks and taste in footwear, he spent the next few hours stalking her around town, then followed her back to her house and crept inside. Oh my god, people are so pleased stop this it's so weird the initial goal was just to grab the shoes and go but while he was pulling off his little orthopedic heist the woman woke up jerry leapt on her and choked her unconscious he sexually assaulted her and ran away this was technically the first crime in the spree which won him a place in the serial killer hall of fame but it wouldn't be connected until years later most of his horrendous crimes weren't committed out in the world like this one but locked away behind closed doors in a custom-built studio dungeon man cave from hell <laughs> did you throw in studio there callum <laughs> because uh if you're not watching this show and maybe you don't even know like the uh, the studio space i have is like a, a semi-submerged basement space in a building so uh it's sort of like a basement it's an ongoing joke on one of my other channels that it's a basement but it, it is a basement technically the window's up there like above me it's perfect for recording because these you know you need studio lights and not outside lights what are we talking about? Let's get back to, to the topic at hand. Ever since moving into their current home, Darcy and the kids knew that the garage basement was off limits, as was the attic. I, I don't understand. I mean, I guess it's the past and stuff where, like, men were in control. But if I told my wife, you can't go in the attic. Well, if we, like, uh, f <laughs> I'll go wherever I please. We both own this house. Brudos implemented a strict entry policy for these rooms. If they ever needed to talk to him while he was inside, they had to press the buzzer on the intercom and wait a few minutes for the heavy bolts to slide open. For most of the marriage, it was a space for him to indulge in his cross-dressing fantasies away from judging eyes. The wife had just got used to the fact that Jerry would disappear into his heavily fortified wank chamber for hours on end, so nobody thought to question what went on in there. In fact, they probably tried very hard to keep it far from their imagination. Yes. <laughs> You'd be like, I, I, I don't want to know. What are you up to in there, Jezza? Just, I don't want to know. But whatever sweaty, sticky... Oh, God, Callum, why are you helping me to imagine this? Why? Sticky ha <laughs> happenings they were imagining going on behind their garage door. It was nowhere as disturbing as the reality. After Jerry's dark lusts returned to the surface in earnest, his pervy little photo studio... Oh, he actually had a photo studio in there. I thought Callum was making a joke at my expense, but no... It's just more of Jerry's weirdness. Uh, became a veritable hell on earth for his victims. When the detectives raided the house, they forced open the door to the garage to collect the incriminating cable and wire. Further analysis revealed that the knots match marks found on the necks of the drowned woman and the ends of the rolls were cut with the same tools. They also discovered a pulley system installed in the roof and lockers full of photographic equipment, women's clothing and shoes, piles and piles of glamorous shoes, along with lists of phone numbers and addresses, all of the sorority houses of Oregon State University. In the attic, there was even more, including boxes of photographic negatives and prints. They featured women posing both clothed and nude, usually in sexually suggestive poses. They were some of Jerry himself, and others featured other familiar faces, those of the three most recent missing women looking close at the faces of some of the images there was no light in their eyes anymore they were already dead in many of the images yet still the outfits and poses changed the women's bodies were being used as lifeless mannequins for brutus's sick photography sessions his fortress of solitude was actually more of a torture chamber where he led women to be humiliated and slaughtered the fact that these were real human beings not life-size dolls for his amusement 
just didn't seem to register. The images he took of those moments and later his candid confessions give us a pretty clear picture of what these women's final hours were like. I don't need to warn you, but it's not a pretty chapter in this already dismal story. The Murders in her book, Lust Killer, a deep dive on the Brudos case, true crime author Anne Rule writes that serial killers almost never physically hurt someone they know. It has to be a stranger, a particular victim type. When they are in the killing mode, it is whoever happens to cross their path who fits the profile. And that's why serial killers are so terrifying. Because like in my real life, like in my real life, in my life, I don't know why I had to preface that with real life. This is real life, you know, it's not, it's not virtual or whatever um but it's like i don't think i upset anyone enough for them to want to kill me i mean despite the like hate messages that you get because it's like you made a video that someone didn't like your take on something or like you said something that someone didn't like whatever like the person that random person is probably not going to come and kill me but like general like offline world i don't think like there's anyone who dislikes me enough to kill me there's people i'm sure there's people who dislike me for whatever reason but I don't even know if there are that many. I, I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of generally like liked. <laughs> but that's what's so terrifying about serial killers. Is like you can be a great person, nice person, just hanging out, doing your thing, and there's like you'll just be murdered for no reason whatsoever, just because you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to kill bald men with beards and glasses, those. And that's why serial killers are so terrifying. You know this. You're listening to a true crime show. For Brudos, that profile was young, pretty women, preferably blonde, wearing stiletto heels. Good news for me, I'm not young, a pretty woman, blonde, or wearing stiletto heels. Or am I? On that note, I'm not. On that cold, snowy January night in 1968, that's exactly how encyclopedia saleswoman Linda Slawson appeared to him when he opened the door. Jerry's heart skipped a beat. He just so happened to be home alone, and here was a beautiful, defenseless young woman right there on his doorstep. Uh-oh. Still framed by the doorway, she gave the usual scripted sales pitch, and Brudos pretended to be interested in buying a package. This is so strange. This used to be a thing. People just, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd knock on your door. Do you want to buy an encyclopedia? And be like, mate, what, what? there's the internet isn't there what are you talking about is it on a cd what i don't cds i don't even have a c i've got many computers i don't think any of them have cd drives anymore because the internet and before that books what what was up with that <laughs> silly but first she should come in out of the cold so they could discuss it further brutus led her into the upper garage <laughs> hi yes come into my house shall we go through to the garage <laughs> How about I just unlatch these giant bolts? <laughs> Come inside. Oh, yes, that's just my pulley system. Mm -hmm. What's that smell? Oh, that's just the flesh of my victims. Uh, sh and Linda busied herself laying out samples and paperwork on the countertop. As she prepared her things, a plank of wood cracked against the back of her head, knocking the woman out cold. After dragging her downstairs, Brutus strangled his victim to death before she could awake. What came next was the truly disturbing part. For Jerry Brutus, the murder itself was actually just a means to an end. What he truly desired were his victim's clothes and corpses. The act of murder itself wasn't the main thrill, but what came after. Once Lawson was dead, he spent the rest of the night dressing up the body in his collection of shoes and lingerie. He then slipped into the victim's own clothes and arranged the body in all kinds of provocative poses for his sick amusement. A few pieces of cloth weren't good enough for a souvenir, so he decided to cut off the left foot so that he could use it to model his shoe collection in the future. Mate, you know that that's not going to keep, right? I'll say now that there's no shame in it. If stilettos and pinky toes are your thing, I'm not here to judge you. Just so long as you keep them attached to a living, breathing, consenting human. That's... My line in the sand. Mine too, Callum. Well done. Jerry Brudos is an example of what happens when these kinds of proclivities get wrapped up with severe psychological complexes. After satisfying his twisted bloodlust for now, Jerry loaded the mutilated body into his car. He drove out to a bridge over the Willamette and faked a flat tire. Once the coast was clear, he popped the trunk and heaved the corpse over the railing into the water below. Brudos wouldn't kill again until another chance opportunity presented itself ten months later. Driving along into State 5, somewhere between Salem and Albany, the killer passed a young woman broken down in a rest stop car park. She was sitting with a group of men who had stopped to help earlier. Hippies, according to Brudos. The young woman was, of course, Jan Whitney. Brudos stopped and offered her a ride to his house to use the phone. He could even grab his tools and try fixing the car himself. She took him up on the offer, which would unfortunately prove to be the worst decision of her life. In Brudos' car, they drove to his house, dropping the hippies off along the way, lest they interfere with what he had in store for the young woman. When they arrived at his house, Brudos tried the door, and it was locked. He told Jan that he'd forgotten his keys and his wife wouldn't be back for a little while yet. Best to just wait in the car until then. So she returned to the passenger seat and Brudos slid into the back right behind her. <laughs> 
what? <laughs> if I'm sitting in my car, I'm sitting as a passenger in the car, and the dri- and I'm in this situation, the driver gets out of the driver's seat next to me and slides into the seat behind me, I'm like, and just starts having a chat, I'll be like, mate, what are you doing back there? <laughs> Why did you get into the back behind me? It's a bit weird. Please, come sit up front, or I just want to go home. The two chatted for a while, leave laughing and playing word games to pass the time. Prudos was just toying with Jan, savoring her company a little longer before turning her into his plaything. Without warning, he leaned forward and wrapped a leather strap around Jan Whitney's neck, pulling her back hard against the headrest. With his knee digging into the back of the seat, he strained to pull the makeshift garrote as hard as he could and kept pulling until Jan stopped struggling entirely. She suffocated to death before even making it inside, which, all things considered, is kind of a small mercy. Once Brudos had her down in the garage space, he hoisted the corpse up on a pulley. It hung slumped over, suspended with just the toes touching the floor. Over the course of the entire evening and through the night, he left the body hanging there, dressing it up in various outfits. And for the first time, he even engaged in necrophilic acts, which for the sake of my sanity, I won't go further into detail here. Yes, thank you, Callum. <laughs> thank you so much. The photos taken that night were among the images discovered in Brutus's collection by police investigators, about as incriminating as a piece of evidence can get. But there was another strange item related to the case which they didn't quite understand the significance of. Warped domes of hardened resin that were clearly homemade, but for what purpose? Hardened resin? Like weird domes. Well, how big are the domes? Um, and why would you make something out of resin? Like a mold of something or i don't know that is weird I'm, I'm not surprised the police were stumped brudos himself proved provide an explanation later on they were resin molds okay cool of one of the victim's breasts oh brilliant taken after he had cut it away from her body oh double brilliant that's disgusting at no point in my life have i ever had breasts but that last sentence still had me squirming apparently brudos did this to try and make metal paperweights in the shape of his victim's breast but he could never quite get the composition right that is so di what is up with you once he was done with these sick experiments brudos tied the body to a railroad iron with copper wire and loaded it into his car he then once again drove to the willamette river and tossed it in linda slawson's foot had to go too after 10 months it was extensively rotted and it was no longer good for modeling stilettos surprise in both of these killings so far, Brutus appeared to have committed the perfect crime. No witnesses, no leads for the investigators. But as these things often go, the more confident the killer became in his own abilities, the more loose ends he left hanging. Brudos never killed again in 1968, allowing time for the heat to die down around the Whitney case. It wasn't until the following spring that he struck again. While cruising around downtown Salem on the morning of March the 27th, Brudos spotted a tall, glamorous woman wearing a perfect pair of high heels walking down the street. The sight of it triggered his predatory instincts, and he decided to follow the woman all the way to the Meyer and Frank department store. He parked his car on the rooftop parking lot of the building, but by the time he got out, his target was nowhere to be found. Jerry was dejected. The woman of his dreams had given him the slip, not knowing how close she had come to a horrible death. Oh, poor Jerry. A pair of teenage girls in a car saw him at that point, sulking in a shadowy corner of the parking lot. After hearing about what happened that day later in the week, they reported driving past this strangely dressed man as they came up the access ramp. He might have even thought about attacking them at that moment, but Jerry was far too much of a coward for that. He needed his victims to be alone. Just as he was about to give up for the day, a lonely woman came walking towards her car toward the stairwell. She didn't match his victim profile, quite like the woman he followed there, but at this point, it didn't matter. This was 19-year-old college student Karen Sprinkler, his third victim, and the first to enter his torture dungeon alive. On the department store rooftop, he came up behind her with the cheap kid's toy gun that he kept in the glove box. Brudos told Sprinkler to stay quiet and follow him, or he would shoot her dead then and there. She complied and was forced into the passenger seat of his car. Sprinkler was under the impression that if she just quietly gave this guy what he wanted, he'd probably let her walk free. So back at the Brudos family home, she kept complying with his demands. She participated in a photo shoot following her kidnapper's directions to appease him. After that, he raped her and told her that he was going to tie her up, maybe for more photographs, or maybe, as she might have hoped, so he could leave her by the side of the road somewhere. I don't know. If I was in this position, I'd be like, if he's seen his face, you know where he lives. It's like, I mean, yes, you might be thinking he's crazy, but... I don't know, I'd be absolutely looking to take any opportunity I can to, like, knock him out or just straight up kill him, because, you know, you know... This is the reason the criminals wear masks, and if they take the mask off and show you their face, you're kind of f***ed, aren't you? Because then you can ID them. 
granted that is knowledge about crime from movies but it absolutely makes sense doesn't it he tied her hands first binding them tight behind her back then a crude noose around her neck Uh uh-oh with the other end of the cord running through the pulley system above a silent moment passed a sprinkler wondered what was to become of her then brudos hoisted her up into the air with three hard tugs and let her die of asphyxiation just as before he left the body hanging there all throughout the night when his wife and kids got home he even stepped out to enjoy dinner with them before going back to his den to sexually abuse and photograph the cold body hanging from the ceiling with nobody any the wiser that was the strange duality in his character that his family and co-workers couldn't quite get their heads around the idea that a man so quiet and amicable could rape and mutilate without remorse seems too bizarre to be true when brudos was done with the remains he once again mutilated the breasts to take another crack at the resin molds then tied the body to a scrapped car engine and tossed it into the river after the murder of Karen Sprinkler, Bruder started to get more systematic in his methods. Rather than waiting for opportunities to fall into his lap, he began staking out the campuses of Oregon State University and Portland State University during that following spring in search of victims. On these scouting expeditions, he would sit in the car wearing underwear stolen from his previous victims and other pieces of women's clothing that he had collected over the years. The first woman to really catch his eye on campus was Sharon Wood, and we already know how that one went down brutus was lucky to come out of that encounter with all of his fingers still attached and, and that he tried to snatch the young girl into his car the very next day in another botched attempt it seems like he was actually quite an incompetent kidnapper when the victims didn't come to his house willingly and nothing got him quite as angry as being defied and defeated by a woman brutus's impotent frustrations were reaching boiling point so the very next day he got all dressed up in his best thong and tights and went cruising around portland with murder on his mind that's when he spotted linda saley on her way to buy a birthday present for her boyfriend he followed her to a shopping complex and lay in wait for several hours as she browsed around the stores rather than brute force his way through this one brudos decided to try a more deceptive tactic when he saw saley coming he circled around the car park and came up behind her linda turned around in shock at the big guy looming over her rather than a gun this time he produced a fake security badge he told her that he was a plainclothes police officer arresting her on suspicion of shoplifting saley said that there must have been a mistake she bought everything she was carrying and the receipts were in the bags but officer brudos explained that she'd have to come down to the station to straighten things out uh I- are we, uh- <laughs> again i know i'm always like well i would do it like this and i would do it like that and i guess in reality at that point i'll be like yeah yeah sure i'll get in your like random car that's nothing like a police car and has no radio or anything like that and like with your dodgy badge but i like to think i'll be like let me have a little little closer look at that badge mate all right you know but the reality is i'll probably be a coward and be like yeah okay policeman i'll come with you please don't kill me curiously enough the station just happened to be his home garage not the most conventional place for an interrogation which is probably how linda worked out that the man sitting next to her had other intentions brutus locked the car doors and drew his fake pistol keeping it trained on her as they pulled up to his driveway that's when he noticed something that could blow the whole plan his wife's car was still parked out front brutus broke out in a cold sweat the house was supposed to be empty Panicking, Jerry told his victim to duck down and stay quiet. He needed a moment to figure out what to do. After a long, tense minute, Darcy came out onto the porch, shouting that dinner was ready. She never spotted the terrified young woman in the car beside her husband. Brutus had no other option but to obey his wife and maintain cover. He tied the terrified Linda up in the back seat and went in to eat dinner with his family. The entire time, he worried that his victim might wriggle out of her restraints and return to safety, but it seems like she still believed compliance would be enough to protect her life after that uncomfortable family dinner (laughs) brings a new meaning to uncomfortable family dinner doesn't it darcy went out to spend her evening with friends giving brudos the opportunity to sneak the kidnapped woman inside while their babysitter kept the kids occupied she is used to mr b spending the evenings down in his man cave so she never thought anything of it neither did she hear the sounds of struggle when linda realized she wasn't going to be let out of the room alive she started to fight back against her captor clawing and biting as the much bigger man struggled to wrap a strap of leather around her neck ultimately brudos came out on top but the damage to his already bruised ego was severe he enacted some of the most severe humiliation and abuse on this woman as punishment for daring to fight back and almost winning for the very last time he performed his hours-long ritual of sexual abuse and photography with one bizarre addition brudos decided to play mad scientist by clamping electrical cables to the victim and hooking them up to a power socket his plan was to run an electrical current into the body to see if he could make it spasm the experiment failed a psychiatrist could probably write fifty thousand words and a guy who takes joy out of turning women to inanimate objects then tries to artificially reanimate them just for kicks i mean <laughs> you could write hundreds of thousands of words about this dude i mean he's 
what is wrong with you? But thankfully, we have neither the time nor the will to venture quite so deep into the darkest depths of Brutus's mind. Yeah, dude, uh, Callum, I'm totally with you. We are already far, well, far enough deep into this psycho's mind. 100%. Let's not go any deeper. Thank you, Callum. Again. And what a strange mind it was. This final victim was saved one indignity at least. Brudos never mutilated her breasts, claiming they were too pink and not the right shape. That must have made a lot of sense to him in his twisted logic, but to the rest of us, the idea just defies understanding. Once all the sordid details of his crimes were released through the press, the American public were too dumbfounded, especially the people of Oregon, where he remains probably the most infamous local criminal. And for a long while, he held the record as the state's longest serving inmate. The trial, so that means they didn't decide to give him the death penalty? I mean, I hate the fact that I'm disappointed at someone not getting the death penalty because uh, we've discussed it a few times. So I don't know what my opinion is on the death penalty, but I don't like the fact that I'll just be like, yeah, kill him! <laughs> or like, I'll be disappointed the fact that he's the longest serving inmate because he's just living in jail. And I mean, I'm sure jail's not a picnic, but it's also not death, is it? The trial. Before they could get him behind bars, though, the state had to build up their case. When we last left off, they had him behind bars for kidnapping and were preparing to add charges for the four missing women we covered. But because Brudos never took photographs or a souvenir from his first victim and her body was never found, only the, th only the final three murders actually went to trial. In those three cases, the evidence from the attic and garage was pretty conclusive, proving that he did the crimes wasn't the hard part. The difficulty would be countering Jeff Brudus's insanity plea. Yeah, I mean, that is a solid plea, because he's clearly insane. I mean, he's a murdering psycho, but he is meant to, he is medically insane, right? He has to be. Although then isn't every serial killer and they do we want them all just to get off because they're insane? <laughs> if they're like, okay, just send them to jail. Send them to jail, please. Or prison or whatever it's called. The pen, as Americans call it, apparently. It's just, again, just movies. Penitentiary, right? We don't use that word in the UK, as far as I'm aware. The difficulty would be countering his insanity plea and proving that he was completely lucid while kidnapping, torturing, and killing his victims. He certainly remembered plenty of the details. After his arrest, Jerry quickly opens up about his crimes. Initial interrogations with Detective Jim Stovall in early June yielded all the grisly details of his 16-month spree. But still, his plea was NGRI, not guilty by reason of insanity. A tough corner to fight considering he had actively hunted for victims, prepared his kill space in advance, and and left it set up throughout, kept his souvenirs, and systematically disposed of the bodies. All of this suggested a man not quite right in the head, but not one that wasn't in possession of all his faculties. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But he, uh, I don't know, I guess that's the thing. Was he in possession of his faculties? Is that, I, I guess that's the thing for insanity. And yes, but he's also insane, right? I mean, he's making like resin molds of women's breasts. No person who's in their right mind is like, you know what that, you know what I should do with that? Let's make some paperweights out of the shape of women's breasts who I murdered. No one's thinking that. No sane person is thinking that's a good idea. His legal counsel must have pointed this out, because just three days before the first trial date approached, the shoe fetish slayer changed his tune. Brutus pled guilty to all three murders and received life, a life sentence for each to be served consecutively. One month later, based on information from the killer, the body of Jam Whitley was finally found, still tied to a railroad spike deep down in the Willamette River. Unfortunately, the whereabouts of Linda Storsons remains are still unknown. Aftermath with the villain behind bars, that might seem like the end of the story, but there was one part which still puzzled investigators. How exactly did the wife fit into all of this? Are we really supposed to believe that her husband kidnapped and murdered four women right under her nose without her knowledge? It's pretty dubious, and the suspicion seemed confirmed the August after Brudos' conviction. An neighbor came forward to report that she witnessed Darcy Brudos helping to carry the body of Karen Sprinkler from the house to the car the night that she was killed. Holy sh you're in trouble now. I'm assuming the corpse was wrapped up in something, or that report was long overdue. Yeah, you see someone carrying a body, <laughs> like, to the boot of a car, you probably want to report that. Don't be like, oh, it's probably nothing. It's probably nothing. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's good. It's all good. It's 
probably got a reasonable explanation. It was only after the key dates were made public during the trial that the neighbor put two and two together and realized that suspiciously heavy rug might have something else inside. So Darcy was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting. She was found not guilty later that year because even if that report was true, there was no way to prove she knew what she was carrying. And in her defense, after his arrest, Jerry actually pled with her to burn the piles of incriminating clothing and images in his collection, and she refused to go along with it. Good. Because you're like, well, he's in prison forever. The only... Wait, no, is he at this point? Probably not. Uh, oh, it's after the arrest. She probably... You probably... You probably know he's screwed, right? So you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Jerry, mate, you're going away for the rest of your life. And I don't like the idea of destroying evidence because I'm pretty sure, like, for some that, I'm, I'm going to go to jail as well. And I don't want that. We got kids, Jerry. You're the crazy one. Not me. All right? I'm going to pay someone to renovate your cellar and attic. It's weird gonna turn it into a gym either she had no idea all that time or she did know but was powerless to stop him or she was totally complicit and was now letting him take all the flack whether or not she, i don't think she's totally complicit whether or not she was really involved in her husband's crime she wanted nothing to do with him now that he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison darcy moved state filed for divorce changed her name and got a court order forbidding her ex-husband from seeing his kids should he ever be released good hopefully he's never going to be released three consecutive life terms well, that's got to be at least a century-ish. He's not getting out. But that day never came. Budos retired from murder for a new life at Oregon State Penitentiary, where he spent the rest of his days. Because of the nature of his crimes and the fact that he was the most famous transvestite in a 1970s prison, he had a bit of a rough start. Oh no! Prison authorities logged dozens of incidents in which Jerry Brudos was beaten or sexually assaulted by other prisoners, one in which he was hospitalized with a water bucket cracked over his head. In an attempt to escape this hell, the killer appealed his conviction at every possible level. Each time, the verdict was upheld, and in 1999, he was even told by the prison parole board that he would never be getting released, partly because he refused to talk about his crimes openly, so they were suspicious that he pr hadn't properly accepted what he did. I'm trying to get on with my life. He nonchalantly told a reporter in 2005 mate you can be getting on with your life inside prison forever where you belong but there wasn't much life left to be getting on with jerry budas died at the age of 67 on march the 28th 2006 after suffering from terminal liver cancer as for the legacy that he left behind four families had to come to terms with the horrifically violent end he inflicted upon their daughters all of that pain and fear just so a pathetic little man could feel powerful for a few hours. And it's possible that he might have ended the lives of many more. Authorities matched up 12 unsolved disappearances which occurred around Oregon during the years in which Brudos was most active, meaning that there might have been many more bodies tethered to the bottom of rivers and lakes left undiscovered to this day. Dismembered Appendices if you thought it was suspicious that Darcy just happened to be absent when Jerry killed most of his victims, there's an explanation for that. Some reports mention that she got a glimpse of his collection of lingerie selfies back in 1967 and decided to spend a lot more time away from the house as a result. Brainwashed accomplice or exasperated wife? You decide. I don't think accomplice. I really don't. I think she's just like willfully ignorant. Maybe. Number two, while Jerry was being studied by the top criminal psychologists of, his, of the fledgling profiling profession, he himself started working and getting some qualifications behind bars. Two degrees in science and two in counseling. <laughs> Dude, no. <laughs> if your counselor is a violent necrophiliac convict, then I'd say you've got a far bigger problem than what's going on in your head. Number three, but it wasn't all work and no play behind bars. Jerry kept the old flame alive by writing to women's shoe companies asking for materials to fuel his sexual fantasies. <laughs> oh my god, that is so. <laughs> that is so weird. Dear large shoe retailer, I have sexual fantasies about your shoes. Maybe you could send me some. Here's my address in prison, where I am forever, for my sexual fantasies. Best regards, Jezza don't no no if anyone sent him she's don't shop there at the time of his death there were piles and piles of these crinkly catalogs lining the walls of his cell i can only hope they gave a hazmat suit to the poor intern that had to clear them out oh man that is disgusting this has been a very long i'm shuffling all the papers in front of me episode of the casual criminalist uh, i do hope you enjoyed it if you did and you're watching this episode please make sure to smash the dislike button wait no that's not right <laughs> smash the like button located that was actually an accident below this video if you're listening as a podcast form there is no like button but if the platform you're listening on accepts reviews especially if it's apple you know what to do leave me a review if you want to make it five stars i like that because i like reading nice things about myself 
It fuels my podcast fantasies, which, you know, well, I guess they're not fantasies. I have a podcast. This has been an episode of Casual Criminalist. I've been Simon. Thank you for watching or listening, and I'll see you next time.